what is it for me? Um, well, for me, it's a it's a way of um, looking more closely into uh, into embodiment, into my embodied experience, and 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 um, like listening to the body. So um, and with all the breath and and movement. Uh, the different dimensions of the body that you might not ordinarily at pay attention to start to reveal themselves and show themselves to you and so you you make space for that and uh, the, the body sort of sort of speaks and, and reveals itself to the awareness that you that you hold uh, in that practice um, and so it, it 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 gives you a more intimate relationship to your body and so to um, to, to your being um, and to the um, to the sort of movements of vital force that that sustain you uh, and um, that's that's something really precious <laughs> Oh. Well, the asana practice should help if done well, but, um, you know, the mind it, uh, isn't easy uh, to calm, and it mostly, um, it, it sort of, it won't be silenced. You have to sort of um, allow it to, to settle down on its own. And so the, the, the sort of traditional teaching in meditative traditions um, you know, and especially in Buddhism, is that you just give the mind space. And that is to say, um, you uh, simply, you simply refrain from allowing your attention to be pulled into the storylines that your mind's continuously spinning out. Um, you refrain from acting out the impulses that the mind is, is continuously um, continuously um, bringing up uh, and you you simply um, observe all of that you know or feel all of that you, you feel it you, you allow yourself to feel it without sort of allowing yourself to get entangled uh, into any projections that the mind might be forming about it, like especially that you are identical to the protagonist of those stories. Um, and so you, you, you just watch the mind with a sense um, of fascination uh, and of compassion for everything that it brings up. Um, without recoiling from anything or grasping at anything, without trying to shape it or reshape it in any particular direction. Um, but you, instead, you just sort of, um, you know, you, you, you hold the mind in a, in a space of tenderness and, and forgiveness and, uh, and you allow it just to, just to unfold and untangle and spin out its stories and spin out its emotions and its impulses and all of that. And, and the, the, the teaching is, and I find this to be true, that if you do that with great patience for a long time, then the mind starts to calm down. You know? And um, it, starts to, it starts to settle and there starts to be a greater sense of spaciousness in your experience and of quiet in your experience and that, that spaciousness and, um, and quiet become in time easier and easier to connect to. How, oh. many, years, uh, uh, how many years before you practice very easy, you know, we watch a lot of video. Uh, how I don't think it's easy at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's never been easy. Good. Yeah, it seems like very easy, but I understand it. Yeah, no, I mean, it was, um, you know, in the very beginning of when I first started Ashtanga, I found it quite painful, very painful. Um, and that 
is because there was a lot of um, grief and sadness for me. That was part of my experience just beneath the surface. And as soon as I started practicing, it was, it was all coming up and coming into, into the body and into my immediate awareness of the body. And, you know, one thing that I realized was that, oh, this is always, this is always there. I'm always in pain. I just don't allow myself to feel that. And when you first start feeling it, it's like it becomes so intense, so amplified. So I was feeling all of this pain. And, um, and you know, I've, I've been doing this now for, for 15 years daily, um, never, never with any significant break or pause. And, and so it's, it's gone through many different phases now. You know, and that that initial sort of sadness and grief um, was was slow to dissipate. It took years, um, but it did d dissipate and it completely dissolved. Um, but you know, life continues and life is hard, and there's more heartbreak coming. You know, and so um, and there 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 are more layers. You know that it's it's um, that the well of the psyche is very very deep. And it's not just the individual psyche that you're working with, but psyche in a much larger sense that includes, you know, something that, that we can sort of all have access to. So there's pain in our collective memory, there's pain in our collective experience, and all of that can present um, for a human being who's open enough very viscerally. And when it does, it can be painful. And so I, I think that you know, it's simply not the case that, I mean, as my m teacher Richard Freeman ha has said, uh, that, that your, ex your experience of this practice is not linear. You know, it's taking you into an, an experience of time that's not, it's not like there's just this sort of linear progression from pain to, you know, a completely, uh, you know, blissful, um, always um, fluid experience of the body. Um, that's a that's a myth. Maybe it's a useful myth for some people at some phases of practice. But um, it, as a matter of fact, uh, as you, as you open up, um, the the you know the the intensity and the um, the sadness, the grief, the longing, um, all of these things sort of come in waves. One thing that does seem uh, however, maybe more more promising, is that your experience of all of that can become increasingly spacious, and so with time, I found that you know year after year, my experience of the body has become increasingly fluid um, and easeful and intimate. Which doesn't mean that you know my flexibility or or, or um, you know, has just sort of, you know, increased in linear fashion. It hasn't. It goes sort of up and down and through different phases, and the, the you know the pains come and go. Um, but my relationship to all of that um, has become increasingly fluid and easeful, um, and uh, my sort of internal and and experience, which feel, feels to sort of expand, you know, outward from the center and to pervade, you know, the entire sensory field is one that has been marked by a sort of slowly but steadily uh, increasing sense of space. I mean, it's 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 you, you you it it's important to sort of look at what exactly it is that is uh, holding you back, and you'll find. I mean, the mind looks for external reasons, you know, not to practice, um, not to have that kind of experience with the body, you know, um, and so the ego tries to the the the, the egocentric mind tries to sabotage. The practice because the because the practice slowly uh, dissolves and undoes that egocentric perspective, you know. Um, 
So usually, you know, there's, uh, there's some kind of story there, some kind of victim story sometimes about, oh, well, it's just, it's too, you know, I don't have the right body for it, um, which, um, you know, of course, is no excuse <laughs> really at all because the practice is infinitely adaptable and takes, it takes all kinds. You know, everyone's welcome. Um, or, you know, there are stories about, well, I have these greater responsibilities now, and there's a sort of projection of self-importance, of being needed somewhere else all the time. Um, but th those are just two of the flavors that those kinds of stories can take. They can take all kinds of forms, but I think that um, when people are in that circumstance, you know, that uh, others who practice and see them um, can hopefully help uh, in a way that is, you know, gentle and friendly to help sort of ease them back somehow into the practice and so back into that more sort of intimate experience of oneself. And then, and then gradually if the practitioner starts to realize exactly where those stories are actually coming from and understand the way that, that they're sort of sabotaging their own um, possibilities for for, for opening and expanding, then that's that's a real that's a that's a real insight. Yeah. Ashtanga is enough or we should add some meditation or chanting or yeah. mantras? Yeah, absolutely. I mean it's um, the the Ashtanga practice sh should involve pranayama and it should involve uh, meditation, you know, of at least two different kinds. Um, there's the meditation of um, of simply giving space and trying to connect with uh, an internal sort of stillness, and then to just steep oneself in that stillness and in that and and, and in that stillness, there's tenderness. So to steep oneself in, into that tenderness so that one uh, is just really practicing deep listening. And then that will allow you to constructively do another kind of meditative practice, which is about reflection, you know, self-reflection. And, and that involves looking deeply uh, into what's actually, what's actually happening, what one's experiencing, and starting to have insights into the way that one's inner experience is manifesting outward in life, the way that what is manifesting outward in life is an is a chance to learn uh, certain uh, lessons, to, to sort of see where one's clinging too tightly or where one is recoiling from something, where one's not integrating some part of oneself into awareness. Um, and that involves a kind of conversation with oneself, you know, uh, a, a conversation that doesn't have so many words to it, but does involve asking questions and listening for answers. And that kind of, it's called swadhyaya in the yoga tradition, you know, um, and both of those kinds uh, of meditative practice are essential to the greater, to the, to the greater the greater practice of yoga. My last yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, a lot of women, women uh, think that Ashtanga is too strong. It's, it's mostly for men. Ah. But uh, what do you uh, uh, say about? No, the strength, the the strength of practice, the strength of any practice, is um, the power behind practice and the and the dynamism behind practice uh, is the dynamism of the creative feminine principle, right? And that's inside all of us. And, uh, you know, the yoga uh, teaches us to give enough space, and that act of giving space um, is often equated, you know, in the, in, in the, in the very tr traditions, the medieval traditions out of which the Ashtanga practice um, grows, that ability to give space is associated with the masculine principle that the um, and so the principle of, of selfless consciousness 
which just gives space for creative dynamism to, to unfold. And both of those energies are inside everyone. And the idea is that through, uh, that through, the, through the practice of yoga, we um, are trying to experience the simultaneous activation of those principles so that ex that sense of space can expand infinitely and that creative dynamism can uh, infinitely unfold. And so it's, there, is a, there is a certain rigidity, unfortunately, um, sometimes in the world of Ashtanga. That's no surprise. Everybody knows that. And that is um, itself a sort of, you know, an, a, 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 a sort of stumbling block, you know, and there's stumbling blocks in every mode of practice. They're unavoidable. They're part of the psyche, what the psyche puts forth. But um, we're moving as a, as a community toward an Ashtanga practice that's more, that's, that's more inclusive, that's more uh, ad, uh, adaptive. And, um, and so one that allows the yoga to work as it should, which is on a sort of more, uh, a, a more personal level and a more intimate level with every individual mind to help them find that, that balance of energies. And I think that, you know, Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga in that respect is profoundly potent. I mean, really just incredibly, incredibly potent. And I really think that anyone who has any kind of leaning toward it or any kind of interest in who, who felt sort of drawn to it in any kind of way should follow that. And, and you know find a teacher that, um, that 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 helps them really connect with that without without it feeling too disciplinarian too authoritarian too forbidding anything like that and also trusting one's own intuition about how the practice should be adapted um, is uh, absolutely crucial because intuition is the intelligence behind practice and if you connect you, you must connect with that you know beyond working with the teacher having good instruction studying well one must uh, awaken one's natural intelligence even to know uh, how to relate well with the teacher and how to uh, integrate things that one learns and experiences into one's further trajectory my dream. Yes. Well, <laughs> um, I think. Well, most, most, most currently, I, I have a dream of uh, opening a new, uh, a new center, uh, somewhere warm, and beautiful. Um, I have an idea about where that is, but I'm going to keep that to myself for now. But I hope to open a new center sometime in the next, in the next couple of years, um, in Europe. Uh, to, to better serve um, the Ashtanga community here. And it will be a place where, where people can come for extended periods of, of practice um, and sort of immerse themselves in the practices of Ashtanga Vinyasa and Pranayama in the Ashtanga tradition uh, and these two kinds of meditation that we were talking about and most importantly, uh, community. Um, so that's the dream that I'm hoping will materialize in the next few years. What is your favorite book? My favorite book. I don't know that I have a favorite book, but my, you know, at, you know, different, different phases of life, I'll have different books that I'm very excited about. One book that always springs to mind when someone asks me, uh, that, that, that question though is, um, is, uh, I mean, really anything by Annie Dillard. I, she's, she's one of my fa very favorite writers, and I, I think that, that her writing is, is, is full of profound insights for yogis, although, um, and she's a yogi of a certain kind, although I don't know if she ever identified that way or ever took a yoga class in her life, but her sort of... Um, She's a, she's a great uh, personal archaeologist of spiritual experience and 
I find her writings um, very inspiring. So let me check that out. Food? Pizza. That's easy. <laughs> and my last, last question, Haku. Uh, what, is you, what do you like as much as Ashtanga Yoga? Maybe you have more hobby or something? Hobbies. Not really any hobbies. Um, no. Ashtanga Yoga. No. I mean, you know, I long to spend uh, more time with my children. Um, I spend... I spend all my time with my children when I'm at home, just sort of immersing myself in their childish uh, innocence and in their 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 incredibly spontaneous um, sort of perception of the world. I love being in that space with them. So when I'm not practicing Ashtanga, you know, or writing about Ashtanga, that that's what I'm doing. Thank you so much. Ah, my pleasure. I wish Thank all you. Thank you. Thank you.